everyone. Looks like we are live. Thank you so much for hanging out, and uh, great to see you. We made it to yet another Wednesday, so that's very exciting. And uh, let's see who we have today on this Wednesday evening. Patty, how are you? Great to see you all the way from Illinois. We have Colette all the way from Wisconsin. Mr. John Deepman, also from Wisconsin. Got a middle Midwest thing going so far. And we have Mr. Roy from Jersey. Great to see you, Roy. So, wonderful group so far. Thank you so much for hanging out and coming to see me on this uh, Wednesday night. Hi, Colette. Great to see you. Just going to adjust the picture a little bit here. And let me see if I can go get our picture of our young lady so you can see the progress. Let's see. Image. There we go. That was fast. Let's see. There we go. Put her right over here. That's good. And Michael Lake. How are you, Mike? All the way from... Now, Michael Lake. I believe you're from... I need a I need a refresh on you, Mike. Tell me where you're from again. I'm so sorry. I'll get it. It just takes a couple of times sometimes, Michael. And uh, Oz, all the way from the Atlanta area. Mr. Willie from all the way from Massachusetts. Great to see you. How are you, sir? So glad you're here. Cheyenne, Wyoming. Great state of Wyoming. How can I forget that, Mike? Thank you so much for reminding me. Michael Lake, Lakes in Wyoming. I'm going to remember it. Uh, I'm going to try. <laughs> but eventually I'll get it, Mike. I promise. I promise, definitely. So I'm so glad to see Willie here. I haven't seen you in a while, sir. How you been? Working hard, I imagine. I, I know you work hard over there in uh, Massachusetts, right? That's for sure. And... Um, so we're actually going to be finishing up this portrait today. So this is uh, a different kind of portrait, right? It's uh, a little more expressive. I always try to be expressive, but I really like the, the kind of apathetic feeling that she had during this photo shoot, right? It, it really is great. And so what a great group we have today. Uh, I'm doing okay, my friend. Thank you so much, Willie. That's how I'm doing. You know, keep plugging, you know. No matter what happens, I just keep going forward, right? Because the time we give up might be just before we get that breakthrough from God. So I keep going forward. So you see me keep doing these live streams. And, you know, regardless of anything, I just keep going, Willie. And that's what I'm going to do, you know, until further notice, until God tells me otherwise. I am going to keep doing these live streams and keep, keep giving the best content I get, I can do, I should say, the best content that I can do. And uh, regardless, rain or shine, right guys? And Dwayne, Mr. Dwayne Marshall, all the way from South Central California. How are you, sir? Go Mustangs, not banana slugs. <laughs> I'm always going to say, oh my God, hey, how are you, Jewel and Ali? Great to see you. Thanks for stopping by and thanks for the wonderful Super Chat sticker. Uh, that is amazing. Thank you. And uh, just a quick note, uh, Essentino, uh, Essentino Media is a wonderful... A wonderful channel where they actually help you find ways to make money on the internet with your content so definitely check them out they really are wonderful you know so I learned a lot a lot of the things I do uh, that help support the channel is directly their influence so Orit and Jewel thank you so much for coming by I really really am excited whenever I see you on the live streams and so far, so good. I didn't do any painting yet, but we will. Uh, let's see here. All right, so 
So this doesn't fit exactly. And you know, it's weird. You know, sometimes they fit perfectly and sometimes, well, like in this case, they don't quite fit perfectly. So when that happens, you just work on protecting one area at a time. And I'm gonna be working on the lower half here of the painting. So I'm gonna make sure that this lines up. Up top, not so much, not as important. Okay, and let's see, this is definitely glasses territory. And the glasses are clean, so that's good. And let me make sure I, I get a uh, angle that is somewhat giving me uh, uh, favorable angles, right? You know, you don't want to, but that light in the back's a little bit jarring. Let me get rid of this. There we go. All right. So, so we have our Extreme Patriot Arrow, the airbrush that we all know and love. And let me go get my water and like always, we're going to start with the detail mixture uh, pretty much one-to-one uh, -one with water because when we go in, we want to warm up. We don't want to go in guns blazing with the dark mixture. That's never a good idea. Be right back. Okay, so now it's detail mixture time. And put this over here. Let's see. If you were detail mixture, where would you be? Right here. Oh, Dwayne said he didn't, oh, played hooky today. He didn't paint. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Taking it easy, huh? Yeah, Willie, you missed a few live streams. We missed you, so I'm glad you're doing okay. I know life gets busy, so we always have a place for you. So never you mind. So, you know, you can, you know, have life happen to you, but know that, you know, we always welcome you with open arms as we have for years, Willie. Willie's been a friend to the live streams for many, many long time. So that's always amazing. So, okay, so I did my four drops, now four drops of water. And shake it up. Okay. And okay, so now I believe I have my airbrush glove in my hand because I was doing some digital art today. And I like having the airbrush glove. Uh, for digital art as well. So let me go ahead. Mr. Steve Leahy, great to see you, sir. How are you today? Love that geisha girl you painted. Holy Toledo, that was nice. So really enjoyed that. And let me straighten out this camera. Let's see. Just be one moment. Move this over a tad this way. See if this regulates itself. Very good. Okay, I can live with this. And now, I, if you don't have Pure Ref, I know I say it every week, but I mean it every week. Pure Ref is a wonderful program. So let's see. Uh, so this is going to be the final part of this particular painting. So it's it's a bittersweet moment, you know. Let me bring her over here. Okay, game plan today. And so, so glad that Mr. Steve is doing well. And it's an honor to have you here, sir. And let's see here. All right, so I think we could stand to work on her beautiful hands. So let's see if we can 
make that happen today. Um, so we'll start with the index finger. And I'm going to use a semi-aggressive eraser. And just going to work on some of the tight details. Not too much. You don't want to go crazy, but it's nice to have some nice tight details for, you know, for your viewers, right? Some interest. People love that. And you have to make your collectors happy. So it's good to work loose and have loose passenger passages. That's for your artist uh, friends. They love the loose, the loose areas. And then the tight areas is usually collectors love when you work like real tight detail. And so that's really good. Once again, I just want to thank God for today and for the ability to have this live stream and get to spend time with you really great people. Thank you. You are a blessing to me. I just want you to know that. And I don't care how many people are here. I just care about the people who are here. That's all that matters. It's not the amount of people. It's the people. And so I just want to let you know I value you all so much. Okay, so I'm working on that finger. And also, you got to start working on the edges as well. So you see uh, right here, we have a dark edge on this side of the index finger. And right down here, it's dark, but it's not as dark. So I'm going to take the aggressive eraser and I'm going to do little tiny circular motions. And this dark in between is more of a lighter color that's kind of open ended and blends into this, uh, this tendon right here. And it kind of just bleeds in like so. So it's kind of open-ended. And then right here, I have it pretty much going in at, let's say, 2 o'clock. So even at this late stage, you may search the angles and say, nope, that's more like 1 o'clock. So you have to be your own teacher, you know, when you're working on your own stuff. But, you know, all those years studying at the National Academy School of Fine Arts, High School of Art and Design, Art Students League, uh, Glassboro State University, uh, all those different teachers and everything, I still hear their voices when I paint to tell me to make these corrections, you know? So uh, that's what I do. Uh, in the live streams, I'm the same way. I will reinforce principles over and over again until they become yours. And that's what I do for my students. And my students over the years have told me they can hear me in their head when they're trying to get away with something. And they know that they're not supposed to do it. And they'll hear me say, nope, you know, make sure you do perpendicular, not parallel, or something like that. Because those are things that principles are important because they're real, real great guidelines to keep us on the straight and narrow. And to keep those principles, because those principles are handed down from generation to generation of teachers to students. And you want to, you want to uh, share them because they work. They're tried and true. And one day when my students have students, they're going to be telling them the same thing and so on and so on. And that's the great Western tradition of art, right, of painting. That's where it comes from. And uh, Steve says he hears voices too, but they tell him different things. Uh, are they PG-13 or rated R, Steve? <laughs> and just bring this down. So as you can see, you know, with her hands, uh, it's now I'm giving, like, total attention to it. You know, it's not like they were important, they were unimportant, but now I have that opportunity to give them an extra attention. Mike says his seven voices tell him stuff all the time. <laughs> seven of them. <laughs> mm. 
Yes, it's it's so important to always, uh, you know, always push ourselves and and uh, you know, seek out teachers who are really going to give us something that we're going to take throughout our whole career, right? And that's what we look for when we're looking for a teacher. Um, to me, it's one of the, the most important things. I'm going to see if I have some information on the hand here. I'm going to come over here to pictures. I think I have the hand here. Let's see. Hand begins with an H. I know that. And so EFG, I think I see something. Well, I did see something, but now it's not there. Okay, so probably over here in this drive. Bear with me, my friends. You know, the old fashioned way is to just go on the internet and find it. And that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to go with hand okay, I'm going to find something good for us. Trust me. Okay, here we go. So, we're going to look for something that has the tendons because the tendons are so important and uh, we'll look at that together. And then we want something in the same position almost, right? Here's a good one. I like this one. Bring this over. Okay, so I'm just gonna save it. Save image as. We'll put it in downloads. Okay, so here goes. Okay, great. So here's our picture of the hands. And a uh, little blurry, but that's okay. And you just want to see these tendons here, how important they are. I'm just going to put that right there so we can see. And... Great. Okay, so now we're working on the, you can actually see what I'm talking about, these tendons and how tight they are, right? They're like really very, very tight, almost like cables that are attached to our forearm muscles. What's interesting is that there are no muscles in the fingers. Would that blow your mind or what? When I tell people that, they're like, no way. Yeah, there are no there are no muscles in the fingers. I find that really amazing. Oscar and Big Briz. That's funny. And so as I'm looking here, even though you can't see this particular tendon, you know it's there. So you're just going to uh, look for how it comes out. Even though it's, it's not tight and at the surface it's still making a bulge so you look for that bulge right there those are the things that's going to separate your work and bring your work to that new level that we're searching for and we can see that this particular tendon coming up here is more attached to this and then this kind of dissipates over here and then we have this sort of light area here and then we have a light area coming down. Now I'm not saying all this is because, you know, it's, you know, that's, you must do anatomy or anything like that. I just think that it's just something added to kind of uh, take your work to that next level. And I know you're all looking for that. You're looking to take that, your, your painting to a much higher level. And that's so, so important. And wow, I can see we have like maybe a 10 second delay. That's amazing how far the delay is. I'm just seeing uh, the screen on Facebook. That's a long delay. Yes, and Steve says, uh, 
uh, that the fact that we have so much control with the fingers in there and no direct muscles doing it is mind-blowing. It sure is, Steve, when you think about it. And Willie says he didn't know that until I told him that long ago. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool to hear. Thanks, Willie. And yeah, so very interesting, very complex. You know, like the shoulder with the scapula and the, uh, the scapula, the acromion process, and the clavicle when they all meet and how the arm moves up and down and side to side. It's just an engineering marvel, you know? God's ways are far beyond our ways, that's for sure. And we're just going to really, really work on... Now, the thing is, I do know, right, that the, that the hand is not the most important part, so we don't want to go overboard, right? We want to keep things in their place. So as I'm working out with color in airbrush and in uh, oils, I always do color studies, uh, checking out uh, for uh, different flesh tones. Something to think about. I know I only I don't do a lot of color on this channel, but just to show you some things that I do, which is always always have your you know photographs, different photographs, different portraits, and try and mix those colors and. Stay in shape with that way. Even if you're not painting in color that particular week, always keep those muscles going, you know? Yes, the, the flanges, exactly. Hey, Patty, great to see. Patty, oh yes, I do see you were here already. So, Patty, uh, always thank you for coming to the live streams. You're amazing. And uh, so, and, and Patty's been with me for a long time, and she does these amazing uh, like, like these uh, models that are to scale, just amazing, and the figures just love them, you know. And Steve says, Tim, by the way, that landscape in oils is fantastic. Thank you, sir. Oh, I, I was thinking about you when I was doing it, you know. Uh, landscapes are interesting. They're totally freeing. Uh, I'm not saying they're easy, as you know. But they're totally freeing, right? You, you're just not dealing with, as Steve is dealing with cars and also figures. And, and uh, with me, I'm doing faces and anatomy and everything. It just seems so free to do a tree, <laughs> you know? And uh, so thank you for that. That was a lot of fun. So Steve, this is interesting. When I'm working, I find to match colors, I do very much better by having a photograph or a printout of what I'm painting rather than working from, uh, from the monitor that I'm able to see colors so much better with a two-dimensional piece of paper as opposed to working off the monitor. Yes, you can get details, as you know, but I have so much better, like my color is like literally spot on very quickly when I'm working on a two dimensional surface. And Steve, oh, so you agree, sir. So what do you think it is about the monitor? Is it that it's pixels and we're really not seeing it as one to one? And also it's kind of lit from behind and our work's not lit from behind. You think that's what it is? It, it kind of makes us feel like we're always too dark when we're painting? Because, I mean, it, it was like literally like light years ahead as far as color, maxi uh, color matching with speed when I actually had the photograph. And one other thing I did was really good, and everyone should try this. I know Steve does it is that print your reference the same size as you're working. So when you step, by, step back, you can see any slight differences. And that really helped with that landscape. And that landscape was a reproduction of uh, George Innes, who was a 19th century American landscape artist. And uh, why I kind of gravitate towards him, because that scene is like maybe a half hour from my house 
Uh, that was painted back in like 1860 and, or 1880. And that was in Montclair, New Jersey, which is not too far from me. And also, George Innes actually went to the same art school that I later attended 150 years later, the National Academy. So kind of like a kinship with him. So it was really nice to, to kind of connect, you know. So the next one I'm going to do is actually a portrait, and I, not a portrait, but a landscape of Corot, C-O-R-O, -O, and he was a French uh, 19th century uh, landscape painter from the same time period, and I'm going to be doing some master copies in, in landscapes because I haven't done many of them, so it's really going to get me in shape, right? And Michael says, I think that the mind initially wants to go darker than lighter. Yeah, I mean, I do find that, Mike, right? I mean, a lot of times when I'm, when I'm, what, this is what happens to me when I mix on the palette, is when I mix on the palette, I think it's darker, and then when I put it on the, on the artwork, it's usually lighter, and I have to adjust it. Um, you know, so it's, it, I do have to adjust it, and it's no big deal, but it's interesting how I, us I usually go lighter. But when I'm working from, from a two-dimensional print, that, is, that goes away, literally goes away, and I can pretty much get those color mixtures really fast. Really fast. And... Again, so I'm going to look at her hand as a whole, right? Uh, that's W-H-O-L-E as opposed to H-O-L-E. -H -O <laughs> and I'm just going to look at the big shapes and make sure I get some of these big shapes because if they're missing, it's going to look a little weird. So definitely don't want her to look weird. She looks angry enough. I don't want her more angry. I'll get an email that I took a painting of her and I made her look like she had strange hands. I don't need that kind of heat. And it's great because with this uh, light mixture, I can do the slightest, most minute adjustments. And while I'm doing the finger here, there's a certain texture in her skin. So I'm pumping that trigger doing little tiny circles and, you know, doing the one second rule as I'm painting. And then, you know, it sort of, uh, it comes together. At this late stage, it's easy because all the other pieces of the puzzle are there. And it just kind of fits. There we go. And, and Steve says that he thinks the difference that the generation of RGB color on a tablet usually using light is different than the pigment used in a photo. Interesting. That is fascinating. And Steve says, because we are all using pigment, it's more comfortable to work, work that way. Interesting. Yeah, because we're doing apples to apples. When we're working off of the monitor, we're doing, it's different, right? Because like you say, they're working with the CWYK or whatever that is, or and then <laughs> and then we're doing RGB. So yes, so that makes a lot of sense. So thanks for sharing that. And Michael says, like when you see the pine tree, you instantly look at the dark tree, not the lighter green or brown bristles. So true, Mike. Yes, and we gravitate towards the lighter areas. I uh, know we graduate towards the darker areas, that's true, you know. And that's why I like painting, uh, I love painting in the airbrush, but I love painting in oils because you have a different approach, you have different abilities, different superpowers, right? We have superpowers with the airbrush, but we have different superpowers with, with oil paints. And uh, it's just so great doing several mediums and now I'm exploring oil paints and, and oils I actually studied for six years uh, with some of the biggest artists 
I studied with Ron Schur, who did portraits in the Smithsonian of the two George Bushes, uh, the several heads of state and stuff like that. Uh, Harvey Dinnerstein works in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, Erwin Greenberg. I mean, just really big names I studied with, with oils. And, you know, it's funny. I, it's not like I picked it up. You know, I stopped doing oils for many years. But when I picked it up, I was trained, so it went like that. It came to me really quick. And um, it just is interesting. Now, working in another medium as well as working in airbrush, I see things differently now because I'm doing about 12 to 15 hours of oil painting a week now is that I see the larger picture a lot more than I did before. I see the larger shapes more and airbrush can kind of make us see the details for me. And now I'm kind of forced to see the smaller details. I mean the larger details as well as the smaller details. And, and drawing so important too, you know. Ah, uh, the smell of an oil painted studio is intoxicating. Yeah, you know, the, the linseed oil from the oil paints and, oh yeah, the wood from, from the stretchers and everything is so true, you know. And in oils, it goes so deep, you know. You can go so deep with mediums and all of that. It's just unbelievable. So that's very important to, uh, you know, and also you can go as, you can go just as deep with airbrush, that's for sure. You know, it's not saying that one is deeper than the other, just different, but I think they work together. I think if you do both, it could really <coughs> take our work to a, a new level. And that's really cool. So yeah, you know, back in the day, I. I was just doing oils for the better part of my career and I would say and then I started doing pastels I uh, did pastels and took that to the level I wanted to and and now I'm back with oils my dad was sick with emphysema and I was afraid that the oils would aggravate it and so and then I lost my paint box that had all my paints and my stable brushes in it. And then, you know, and then that kind of, you know, derailed everything, you know. And that kind of made everything kind of, uh, then you kind of think of the barrier of entry going into, or barrier of re-entry going into oils with the, with the paints and everything. But I find that you can definitely start oil painting under $200. And that's for everything. I mean, hit the ground running and have supplies for the next six months. And that's what I did. And um, I'm so happy I did. But it has helped my, my uh, airbrushing because it's like looking at things differently in a fresh way. And, you know, so that's really the way that we should do. We should not do other mediums like it's going to take over. No, I think it enhances other mediums. And it really enhances my airbrush. And it makes me fall in, air, fall in love with airbrush even more. And respect airbrush, how difficult it is because now I can look from the outside looking in. And there's some avant-garde approaches that I have with airbrush that I apply to my paint brushing and, uh, and, and vice versa. Wow, so you use oil highlights. That's really exciting. So yeah, so you just get like a you know, some nice impasto and put that on there. That's great. And Steve says, Tim, uh, have you used the water soluble or, or oils? Very good question. So I felt like I was cryogenically frozen when I stopped oil painting 
many years ago, and I'm not going to date myself because you'll feel sad for me, but it was many years ago, and I felt like I was cryogenically frozen. When I came back to oils uh, in, the, in January, all these new things like water-soluble uh, paints, I mean, there were different ways of cleaning your brushes, and everything was upside down. And one of the things that really fascinated me was the water-soluble paints. So I did a lot of research, and one guy who I really admire on the internet, he's pretty good, he does an academic approach to painting, and uh, what he was showing was, is that, you know, they weren't, since they were water-soluble, they don't have that binder of the linseed oil, so there's something other chemical in there, and it kind of separates the pigments and it really looked terrible, like the cadmiums and everything that should be really beautiful looked really terrible. And so I find that it's, a, it's great for those who work in oils and may be allergic to it. But I think if you're not allergic to it, then the water mixables are really not a way to go. Right? Definitely. Uh, definitely go go hard or go home, right? That's how I feel. Now, there are some really great things that are new that weren't back when I was oil painting at the academy, is that the solvents are much healthier. Uh, there's a brand of paint called M. Graham, which is really cool. They are out of Portland, and they use walnut oil as opposed to linseed oil, which is a little bit healthier. And their solvents are made with natural ingredients like like walnut oil solvents and stuff like that. Then there's this spike lavender oil, which is still toxic to some extent, but it's a lot less toxic of what we used back in the day at the academy. We were like the toxic avengers in art school. We used to work with, we should have been wearing hair hazmat masks and stuff, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, what I found is coming back to from back back then to now, there are so many different brands of oil paints. Oh my God! Really, there was like two or three, and that was it back then. And you know, those two or three are still around: Winsor and Newton, Grumbacher. You know, but that was basically it. Shiva, that was it. Now you have. You have M. Graham, you have Rembrandt, and uh, Utrecht, which I love, uh, Michael Harding, and David Daniel Smith, and all these, so many different, and then there were student brands, uh, student grade, there was no such thing as student grade back then, and so, so now it seems like there's so many more choices, but too many choices is sometimes make things much harder for people starting out. But I did find a great brand out of Brooklyn called Utrecht. And you purchase them at Blick. And I'm not sponsored by Utrecht by any means, but the pigment load is really high. The quality, the mixture with the linseed oil and, and the vibrancy and the color matching is really great. And it's probably one of the least expensive you can purchase. And you can get them on sale sometimes for less than $5 a tube. And that's amazing, you know? And so, so Michael, do you, now I know you don't spray it through the airbrush, uh, but you might, do you ever spray it? That's what I thought, you know, at one time, you know, do I, do I spray this? Can I spray this through the airbrush? But that is like so toxic, it's almost like like having a death sentence, spraying it. I guess you would have to have really incredible ventilation, uh, you know, like a respirator and open windows and everything. It's just like when you spray cadmiums and, and leads and different things like that, that could really cause a lot of problems. So definitely uh, always be, I mean, I would love to spray oils. That would be the best of both worlds. But here are the things with oils that I want to share with you guys. 
There's no reason why you can't do an underpainting in acrylic, you know, do a full color acrylic painting underneath because oils works perfectly over acrylic. So I wanted to share that with you guys. Michael says, no, never tried it. I've heard people doing it on motorcycle tanks. Yeah, that's interesting, Mike. And Steve says, Winsor & Newton told me, please don't do that when I... <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like Steve when you ask that question it's like there needs to be like an intervention you know <laughs> where do you live we'll come get you <laughs> because you're literally like uh, can I uh, can I light candles next to my dynamite storage you know <laughs> would that be bad <laughs> When I turn on the gas, if my friend Muggsy was in the stove, that's from Bugs Bunny. Yeah, that is funny, you know. They go, oh no, this person, we need to get a hold of this person that right away, you know. Like, we're all airbrush artists and everything. Fixative, have you ever sprayed that stuff? That stuff is going to, like, kill birds within a five-mile radius. That stuff is so toxic and so horrible. When my students sprayed, I'm like, make sure you're downwind and there's no, you're not going into the neighbor's, neighbor's yard. And, you know, it's really, that stuff is just terrible. There are so many horrible things that, as artists, we deal with. Here's another funny thing about oil paints. They say when you when you use the rags, you know, just be worried that, you know, when you draw them away, that they could spontaneously combust. And I'm like, oh, thank you. You know, uh, that's good to know that I can burn down Little Fairy because I'm working on a landscape in oils, you know. So it's like these really weird kind of like things to worry about. It's like they didn't tell me that in, in art school that my, my supplies can spontaneously combust. And let's see, so right now, um, I think what I can do is I'm gonna come in with our white pastel. I'm gonna work on her hand a little bit, really bring that together because it's not, it's not the star, but the hands are the supporting actress. Now here's a good thing, never ever ever use a stump that you use for graphite with pastel. It will be just, you'll know in a moment, you'll know the second it happened that you should have listened to me. So please don't do that. It will ruin your artwork and it will just look so horrible and I don't want that to happen. So always use the stump that is dedicated to pastel with only the white pastel and graphite with only the graphite. Now when you're doing the tortillas, the tortillas, they're good when you have tacos, but when you're doing the tortillas, uh, it actually is like an accordion. So what we want to do is take a needle, not a good needle, and see how we can do this. Dun, 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 dun. Like that. Look at that. Whoa. Here you got it. There you go. So now you have a much sharper, longer tortilla to use. Not a tortilla. And Willie says he's always been told that, but has anyone ever heard of it or happening? Yeah, I, I haven't heard of it happening, no. And uh, it is frightening. Uh, it's enough to get my attention, Willie. <laughs> Imagine if you did, you know, the, the house burned down, you're like, uh, do you know what happened? No, I'm an airbrush artist. I don't even touch oil paints. Why would you ask? And they're like, we didn't even ask you were working in oils. So that's what I would do. I would spill the beans before I was even accused. And let's see. Uh, Patty says, hope everyone had a great rest of the, have everyone has a great rest of the week. She needs some shut eye. Patty, thanks for coming by. Always a pleasure. Please don't work too hard. And I hope you have an amazing weekend. And let's see uh, who else here. Michael says, 
He think he read about spraying oil paint in an airbrush, an airbrush magazine a long time ago. And could you imagine cleaning it? Oh, wow, yeah. It would be a real mess. And the thing is, with the... You can spread oils out, but to spread it out that much, you would probably have to use turpentine, which again is like just dangerous on so many levels. Steve says, Tim and all, it's always a blast hanging out. I need to crash. Big day tomorrow. Have a great day, Steve. Always a pleasure. Take care, my friend. And keep doing the amazing artwork. You know, it's just a pleasure to see. And it's always inspiring me. Thank you, sir. You're the best. And so let's see. And uh, that is scary, yeah, to the idea of uh, spontaneous people combusting and the cadmiums and all that. Uh, so, yeah. So that must be why, like, you never see in airbrush paint, like, a cadmium red or a Naples yellow that's made with lead. So it would always have to be your you know, your synthetic colors, right? That would be able to be used through the airbrush. Otherwise, it would just be too toxic. So now we're coming in with the white pastel and really accentuating her hand there, making her hand as beautiful as her face. And if the rags want it up, they create their own heat and can combust. That's what I read. That is what I read exactly, uh, Dwayne. It's really frightening. That's some scary stuff. So definitely something to uh, really be weary of. And just like that. Now I'm working on her hand here. And I just want to, before I start erasing it just see now I can always come in with an easy eraser and tap and as I tap it I can take away as much as the pastel or little as I want which is good and I have to remember of the big shapes right big shapes big shapes the little shapes come later Yeah, that is really something, you know, with the wadded up, you know, with the rags and the spontaneous combustion. And then there's this whole new school of thought. And get this, is that you just leave your brushes indefinitely sitting suspended in linseed oil. And I'm like, no way am I going to do like a $20 brush and just leave it in linseed oil for days. That's just maddening. So a lot of weird stuff has come about you know in the past 20 years with 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 oil paints and i'm sure that if we stopped uh, airbrushing for 10 years we would probably be like oh my god what are they doing you know all these new techniques see now we don't see it because we're all involved in it right we don't see the changes because they're gradual but i'm sure airbrushing is totally different than it was 20 years ago now, those veterans out there, like Dwayne, do you do you see a lot of big differences in airbrush in the past 20 years, sir? And Dwayne says, back when he sprayed thinner base paints, he would toss the rags in a metal can with water. That's what they say to do, right? Because the water will stop them from heating up. And Mike says he's seen a rag can catch on fire with thinner base paint. Oh, man. That's... That's, this is a good conversation because these are things that very few people really talk about in the industry, but it's a very important concern. You don't get a second chance with a fire. So definitely, I'm going to be drawing my, my rags, my paper towels. Uh, I'm going to be drawing them in the garbage outside later after this live stream. Now what I can do is I could just lightly rub the white pastel over the darker areas of the finger so the fingers doesn't look blotchy. See that? Just kind of smooth that out. There we go. 
Mm-hmm. Huge differences. Oh, listen to this. So Dwayne says, huge differences in materials and availability of supplies. That's fascinating. And so that is, and then uh, let's see. Some really, really amazing, amazing information tonight being shared. And that's another thing, you know, we're having this conversation because I'm learning about spontaneous combustion with another medium, and now I'm learning with airbrush artists that it happens as well, that we have to be careful, you know. Not with acrylic, but definitely if you're using solvent base, which many of us have. I've used solvent paints before. So here's something for you, Dwayne, I think you'll find interesting. Last night I was on uh, YouTube and I was watching an art uh, history documentary and they were talking about the painting, painter El Greco, which is from, he's from like the 1500s. Of, uh, he painted mostly in, he studied in Rome, he was from Greek, studied in Rome, and then finally settled and painted in Spain. But he liked to paint on copper. Now, has anyone here painted on copper? Have you? Because I think I'm going to paint on copper. Um, I'm, prob- I'm excited about it. And you can actually oil paint and do airbrush on copper. So that's something. Because of the, because of the copper underneath, it gives a kind of uh, luminosity to the figures or the portraits. So that is going to be really interesting. So, and I do have some aluminum panels I want to work on too. But next week we're going to start a a portrait, an airbrush painting in color. So uh, are you guys excited about that? It's going to be the first one I've done in color since 2017. That's a few years ago. <laughs> Just a little bit of time since I've done color on this channel. So this is going to be a lot of fun. I've done uh, pastels, but this is going to be the first airbrush uh, acrylic painting that I'm going to be doing starting next week. Well, we're going to be doing the underpainting which still will be in under India ink, but then we're going to go over it. And uh, so Dwayne says he hasn't personally, but had a girlfriend that only painted on copper. Wow. And was she an oil painter or was she an airbrush painter, Dwayne? Michael says he tried it once. You have to watch the thinning of the paint or it will separate on. Oh, that's great. So you got to make sure that paint is kind of thick. Is that correct, Mike? Great information, Mike. Thank you for sharing that. Guys, I'm going to use a little boy's room. Please, oh, oil painter, that's amazing. Uh, please, great conversation. Please continue with yourself until I get back. Thanks so much. Be right back, guys.
Okay, so I am back. And yeah, so, so yes, oil paint. So, now do you guys find that, uh, so there's that whole thing, you can't serve two masters, meaning that if you work in two mediums, you're going to love more than the other, and eventually you'll hate one. That's, that's a thought process. But I'm feeling that as I get older, that when I work in different mediums, I, I can see each medium from like a different point of view. And then the work gets actually uh, more innovative. That I start thinking more outside the box because I'm thinking of oil painting as an airbrush artist and thinking of airbrush as an oil painter. You know, I'm seeing those different things, which is really amazing. And let's see here. And okay, so we're still working on the hand. And we're still going to be working on the lights here. And Dwayne says that the worst thing he tried was airbrushing Zinn bleach on a big hanging banner. Definitely don't recommend it. Oh my god. That's kind of like being the Toxic Avenger, right, sir? Oh my goodness. And then Michael says, copper scratches easily, so can't really scuff it up. Oh, so you got to be careful. So is it much, is it more delicate than, let's say, uh, aluminum is, sir? So that's really interesting about copper scratching easily and that's great information now it is a little it's a lot more expensive than working on wood but uh, definitely you know is something that I would love to explore both working with airbrush and working with brushes paint brushes as well Oh, it's the sheen on the copper. Yes. Yeah, so that is something that, you know, I'm sure it's going to have its own little pros and cons. So that's going to be interesting. But not so much, you know, like, I don't think I want to do it because of the novelty of it. But just that the fact that, you know, the properties of copper is really amazing. as you can see her hand is really starting to look a lot softer and that's what we want and I'm not going to go too far into detail but just a nice indication of some of the details really makes a big difference especially her hand going you know kind of foreshortened here right this finger and then we can just take our needle eraser and just tap that like so and then we have a nice feeling of her fingers in three-dimensional space. And like you could, you could pretty much spend, you know, three hours on one hand easy. But the hand is a supporting actress. It's not the, it's not the star of the painting. So we have to relegate it to that. Otherwise, it'll kind of be out of whack. And so that's really cool. And so Dwayne says that it was, it was crazy toxic, even with a respirator. Man, yeah, that people faint just from the regular fumes of just the bleach in liquid form, right? So that must have really been scary. I'm just going to make her, her nail bed a little more gentle here. Less harsh, more refined. That's what we have to do. 
we want to do. Same thing here, just refine this nail bed and get rid of some of the harsh contrast. Always remember, you know, I always talk about it, but it's so true. We want to make sure we keep the values compressed when need to be, right? We, we don't want contrast where there isn't. And we as people like contrast, you know? So, especially in our artwork. So we have to fight that kind of uh, propensity to do that. And we're gonna build up the light where the knuckles are hitting, facing the light most. And so see how I do that by building up that light. And now her hand looks more three-dimensional. And you can see how by building up that hand, we still realize we have more to do with the face because now the hand is slightly more advanced, uh, you know, with detail. So that's how one thing like a domino is going to affect another one, which is really important. And... And again, this hand is so important because this finger is in front of her, front of her, her lips here. And now it, it really helps uh, with the composition and helps with the realism. And I really like it when it works like that. Um, yeah, you'll find that, oh, I can get away with doing that hand, you know, be lackadaisic with it, but we really can't. Uh, we'll pay the price if we try and let it go at that. Like I said, I can take this to like really, really far. I'd love to, but it's, you know, you gotta, if you reach all the objectives of your painting, then you're done, right? And so that's how we have to look at it. You know, uh, what did we learn from this painting that we can take to our next painting? Right? Those are the kind of things you kind of take away from. Now I'm going to paint her clavicle right over here. And it's much lighter, so I'm coming in with the white pastel here. See, this area, it, even though it's a very minor area, we still have to give it some attention. We can't just let it go. Uh, we have to really push... Mr. Aunt Todd, how are you? Got a great to see you. Michael says he's got to go work early. Have a great night, Mike. Thanks for hanging out in the great comments. I really appreciate you. Hope to see you next week. And so I'm so glad that Mr. Todd is here. How are you? How's your hand feeling? And as you can see, just bringing, bringing this over, this light, because the clavicle is facing the light most directly, and so very important. And then there's this tendon right here. We're just going to accentuate that just a little bit. bring in just a little bit of light over here and so now it's really coming in with these lights here we're gonna do some paintbrush action do some of these errant hairs here and there and uh, so now it's really getting down to uh, really hitting some of these uh, light accents that are really going to, this is like the, the final, the final push to finish this painting, you know? So he's doing okay, as, uh, still, his arm is still bothering him, so sorry to hear that. And now I'm praying that you feel much better, sir. And let's see. Okay, so I did the, this is called 
there is actually a muscle and I did know that muscle by heart and I don't right now but I will get the name of that muscle for you momentarily let's see okay so ooh, let me get out of there Okay, circulatory muscular system. All right, so that particular muscle is called the depressor septi, which is very interesting. So this right here, coming straight down, not the not the septum, but this muscle right under there, that's called the depressor septi. And so that's what I'm going to be putting in right now. This is a very important part of her expression. Here it's not as dark, so there's some light hitting this area. I'm going to make sure that I show that. One second rule is really key when doing something like this. Right above the finger, we have a blast of light right here, right above the finger. And real buildup of light here. There, that works. And so that's cool. And you can see that I have to make sure that I make the compression of the values in line with the with the model and the lighting situation so i might have created more i created more contrast than that's than that's there right so at this late stage this is where you have that final opportunity to match the dynamic contrast have our eraser and we can go fix that definitely you know it's funny how we we make more contrast is there because we want to see that contrast it makes us feel comfortable especially when we're painting we want those those shapes defined right the nostril and but in reality, a lot of times it's just kind of fuzziness. And I'm just going to rub this light. Just as the slightest bit of blue shift when that happens, then you just tap that away. You, you push it as much as you can, but once you see that blue shift happening, even with the white pastel, you just back off and erase that. but you have far less blue shift than you ever would have if you were, let's say, you know, working with, you know, white acrylic or something like that. You would have no wiggle room whatsoever. Hey, Mike McClung, how are you? Great to see you, sir. How's everything going? Now, Mike, are you from the Baltimore area? 
just want to make sure. It takes a couple of times before I get where you where you are. Michael Lake is from Wyoming, so I'm getting that. And so, Mike, I think you may be from uh, from Baltimore. Let me see if I got it right, sir. Great to see you, by the way. So glad you're here. Okay, so now we have her beautiful lips. So let's see if we could use the point of... I'm actually going to use uh, something different. This is a charcoal white because I can get a better point with it. And let's zoom in. Let's see how that goes. Right over here, where we can focus a little better. Now I am a little strong with that, but that's okay. I can always dial it down. So you see here, I use the uh, the white charcoal to get the really bright, powerful light there. Then I'm going to use that right here. So. The light is on the right of those creases. I'm sorry, the left of those creases. I'm gonna put some of those little, little lines here. Let's see how successful we get. Hey, Bob, how you doing? Great to see you, my friend, all the way from, from, from uh, San Francisco. And I was, I in the Baltimore area, so I. I get half credit, right, Mike? So that's great. So, Bob, great to see you. How's life out in San Francisco? <coughs> Just gonna take a sip of ginger ale here. So, Bob, we were having a very good conversation on this topic, and I think you're perfect for it because Bob works in many, many mediums, in many different disciplines. So we were saying, Bob, do you feel, the question is, that working in different mediums helps you with both mediums? Like when you're working, let's say, in pastel, does that help you when you're working in acrylic and airbrush? Do you find that, that having different mediums actually uh, makes you a better artist? Putting in some of the lines uh, in her lip there. Very cool. Now I'm going to uh, just come right over here. And here, if I really zoom in, it's not so much, this is the light is like right in between and it's much softer on this side. And then right here we may have a light specular light right there. And okay, so that seems to be it when it comes to that. Maybe lighten this up here. Uh, ah, thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. Bob says that she's looking good. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate that. Let's see. And I, I personally feel that working in several mediums actually 
is a good thing, you know? Really is. Let's see. Okay. All right. So, so I'm happy with that right there. I don't want to go too overboard. And let's see if we can come over here. So we see we are getting... I think I can kind of calm down the specular light here just a little bit. A little bit out of whack sometimes. And okay, so underneath her eyes. I know that's a really important uh, feature and she does have dark under her eyelid. So we're going to keep that. I was thinking it may be too dark. But this area can be lighter. So I'm going to take that white pastel and this cast shadow is much lighter. So I'm just going to kind of intermittently disperse some white with spaces in between just to kind of lighten that up because, uh, you know, like I said, a lot of times we are darkening things up because it's more comfortable for us. But even though it's, we see that it's lighter, but on a conscious level, we just want to make it lighter. That's why, you know, the cheapest inkjet printer can reproduce something so much faster, not because it's smarter, because it, it doesn't have its own, its own preferences that we have for order and everything like that, you know? And right in here, I'm gonna see if I could use the white pastel. Now you gotta be careful and it is working, so I'm able to do that. But sometimes you'll get a blue shift, so you want to be weary of it. And when the blue shift happens, you back up and you erase it. So Bob says, yes, he loves to move around media. Each medium informs the others. Uh, torch firing some glass enamel onto copper this week. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Mini portraits and the color shifts are spectacular as the metal cools. That's amazing. Yes, yeah, so that's exactly so. That's great insight from Bob. Thank you. Pam, how you doing all the way from Virginia? How are you? I'm so glad you're here. How was your week? I hope you got to do some artwork. And if not, no pressure. You know, just, just keep, it, keep it in your mind, you know. It's going to... You know, that's what we got to do. We got to keep talking about art, hanging around people like like here to, you know, get us inspired, right? So that's that's what we have to do. So you come to these live streams, we're talking about art, inspiring each other. So that's great. Oh, great. So I'm so glad that you painted something. And uh, so what's your favorite thing to paint, Pam? Your favorite subject matter? Oh, that's great. So you're slowing down. Yes, and that's important too, right? So definitely, Pam, we have to make sure that, you know, we let things kind of kind of mature, you know, like each painting grows at its own rate, like kids, right? Some kids, you know, become mature really fast. Same thing with paintings. So we have to, you know, let them, let them kind of do their own thing and grow at their own pace. Definitely agree. And, uh, oh, ocean, that's great. You know, I just got some, uh, I got a tube of uh, Prussian blue yesterday. And uh, what a wonderful color. Have you guys used Prussian blue before? It's this real neutral blue, but it starts out black. I mean, really black. And, but as it lightens, it has just this slight green as it gets closer and closer to white. It's just really beautiful, and it just spreads so nicely. I, I just love Prussian blue, so definitely going to use Prussian blue sometime soon. 
And Michael says he has never done a portrait yet, not to say that I will not, but it is intimidating for me. Oh, well, if you ever need any help, you let me know. Uh, it's all like a mindset, right? I know you can do it, Mike, definitely, but we got to get into that mindset, you know? Uh, each painting, you know, each subject's going to have its own, you know, things that, that we feel comfortable with, and then things like, oh my God, what I get myself into? Uh, oh, yeah, so you use it too, Pam. I love Prussian blue, yeah. I like ultramarine. I like ultramarine better than cobalt blue. And I do love ultramarine, but I find that ultramarine has a, a reddish tint to it. It's, you know, especially like in the mid-tone stages, you can see it. And um, it's good in certain circumstances, but uh, I just love having that particular blue. And the funny thing is, there was this, the reason that that Prussian blue was invented is that in the 1800s, they finally learned that they can do chemical reactions and create colors with the chemical reactions. And this person was trying to make a red and but you know he made the chemical reaction and the next day he was expecting red and he ended up with this blue and he discovered this blue on accident by trying to get red and that was like one of the first blues that uh that was affordable because the word ultramarine means uh, on the other side of the ocean beyond the ocean because Blue was only available from Afghanistan with a color called lapis lazuli. And so with the advent of this accident, all artists of all economic strata could afford blue in their paintings. So at the time, you know, like when Mary Cassatt was painting in like the 1860s, 70s, 80s, uh, you see that they use this color all the time, especially the Impressionists. And that's really cool. Ah, uh, Dwayne, thank you so much for the super chat, my friend. I really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for all your great comments and your support and your friendship. And I really appreciate you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really, really uh, heartfelt thank you, sir. And so very interesting about that. Uh, Thalo Blue is a little different. Uh, Thalo Blue came about, I believe, in the 1930s, between 1930 and 1950. And I like Thalo Blue, but I find that it's just too powerful, that even just a little bit will overpower everything. So it's like the, the color that took over Detroit, you know? It's like, I want to make sure that I um, don't overdo it. So I like the tinting strength or just a little bit less of the tinting strength with the, with the, uh, with, with that particular blue, which is the Prussian blue. It's also called Parisian blue. So that's another name that some companies, uh, paint companies call it. But isn't that cool? You know, he's trying to do red and then that just goes to show you that sometimes the accident is the biggest success, right? Isn't that funny, Pam, right? Uh, and oh, so Pam said that Thalo Blue you learned today by accident. Yeah, it is definitely a crazy color. But what a beautiful color. Uh, I also find that Thalo Blue is, uh, when you mix it with yellow, you get kind of strange greens that don't look uh, natural. So I ordered a tube of uh, permanent green light from Utrecht, which should come tomorrow or Friday because I'm going to be doing a lot more landscapes. And oh, so Bob says he thinks Prussian blue was the first synthesized pigment. Yes, definitely. And uh, it definitely was one of the first. And it was just amazing how how that kind of uh, changed how blue was available. Like if you look at the days of, of Rembrandt or, or even uh, Caravaggio, Michelangelo, you didn't see a lot of blue because it was just too expensive. 
And that's where the whole idea of glazing came up because they would paint it and then they, at the very end they would do a light, light glaze of the, like a, almost like a film over a lighter color to make it look like it was painted with blue paint. Interesting. And Dwayne says, I guess I'm in a more old school, uh, old school poor airbrush artist. I use mostly primary colors and mix as I go along. I like that a lot, and I think that shows great skill. And so I really applaud that. That is really great to do that. And you work uh, also, you work with uh, like House of Color paint a lot and stuff like that, Dwayne. So it probably in your best interest not to have all these cans of different colors, I imagine. Uh, so that's, you know, you're solving very real-time problems uh, by using, you know, fewer colors, I'm sure. Now, I painted in pastel for many, many years, so I like using a lot of colors. So I'm taking that knowledge of using a lot of colors and kind of bringing that into my pastel paintings. I'm sorry, bringing that into my oil paints and how I use oils is that I don't shy away from having a lot of colors because I'll need them. It's not like I'm not going to need them. So I would like to have a shortcut flesh color so I can just tweak it just a little bit to get where I want, just like if I worked in pastel, right? And almost exclusively Createx color, Dwayne says. Oh, cool, cool. They have a really great uh, line of colors. Do you find it more comfortable to mix your own color as opposed to uh, having a shortcut color, Dwayne? Because some people like the shortcut colors. Um, love to hear your insight on that. Ah, uh, Bob, thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. Bob, uh, always appreciate your your friendship and your support, it means a lot and it really helps the channel. And it's always great to see you and you always give the just amazing commentary and you bring a lot to the conversation. Thank you, sir. Thank you for sharing your talent. And Dwayne says, he used to buy all kinds of different colors, but I would just end up tweaking them anyways. Yes, exactly. Like that Prussian blue, you know, it's so beautiful, but it's going to be very rare that I use that Prussian blue straight out of the tube. I definitely will adjust that. Last night I was doing a, uh, a demonstration with a student and we were doing like a black background. But the first time I used Prussian blue is I added the Prussian blue to black and got this amazing, beautiful, cold, dark, and it was just wonderful. So... Yeah, you know, it's like, there's a color I'm waiting on, it's called Caput Mortem. And Caput Mortem is very interesting color, and it means like dead body or something like that. And it was made from mummies. It's an actual, you know, traditional color, right? It's been used like in the times of Rembrandt and everything. So, now they don't make it out of mummies, thank goodness. But I like that color because it's like a really deep, dark violet. And it's perfect when I'm doing those dark shadows that are like right over here. Uh, it would be perfect to have that as a starter color and then tweak it as opposed to having to go to that dark. Of course, you can mix that color, but that's an extra step. So I would definitely have to get like, you know, burnt umber, ultramarine blue, and then a cadmium red to get to that caput mortem, which I have a tube coming. So I'd rather have that caput mortem on my palette and then just tweak it as I need it. Because that's what I do when I work in pastel. So the pastel methods are gonna kind of creep into, creep's not good, uh, kind of spill into my, uh, my oil painting. And now next week I'm going to start working in color in airbrush and we're going to see just how much of my pastel and how much of my, my oil is going to work and influence a color painting in airbrush. So 
Stay tuned for that next week. That's going to be great. Of course, next week is the first. The first uh, is the first day is pretty much going to be working on the underpainting. Maybe just a little color at the end of the session, but not much. There we go. And maybe we can darken this up just a little bit, like so. Okay, so now what we can do is let's get a paintbrush out and see if we can go ahead and start doing some of those errant hairs because we have to do the contours on the outside of the hairs, which is going to be great. And, uh, and Dwayne says it's just easier for him to get big bottles of primary colors and mix along with a few pre-made colors. Very cool. Yeah, it is, uh, it is very interesting, right, Willie? Um, let me see. I like using the tops of those, uh, those Walmart uh, two-ounce cups. Let's see. We're going to go get one. These are great. Rather than use the actual cup, I'll just use a little bit there. And great. And let's go ahead and put some. Now, do I do the detail mixture or the medium mixture? I'm going to do the detail mixture first, and then I'll come in with the medium mixture for the super dark ones. But I'll do the medium mixture straight up. No dilution. I mean, the, the detail mixture straight up, no dilution. And let's wet this brush. And what you want to do is when you actually wet the brush, you want to get rid of the excess moisture, like so. And you see, you get a much lighter, finer line. And now what we're going to do is kind of look for some of these very light, kind of wispy, because it's the contour, right? You, her hair will not look natural if it's just, you know, no, frizz, no frizzies or anything like that. That doesn't happen in life. Although women would love that, right? always have these anti-frizz stuff because a lot of times you ladies have a lot of hair. And Bob says, Celier sells a nice Caput Mortem pigment which mixes well with various media. Funny you should say that because that was one of the few brands that sold the Caput Mortem. So I'm actually getting a tube of the Caput Mortem uh, in their oil paints. So that is interesting. And I, I kind of fell in love with that color from, from my store in the, uh, the catalog. So it is a really nice color. Now my question to you is, Bob, I find that the Caput Mortem often has uh, an overly violet kind of, that you kind of have to kill it a little bit with raw sienna. Now, is that the case in that you find? Or is it a nice, more neutral, as opposed to having that real huge violet undertone, violet undertones? And so just coming here, and now I'm going to really hit some of the values. And of course, if anyone's interested in this painting, it's available, and it would only be $125, so that would be an incredibly low rate, so that's not that anyone will, but if it speaks to you, let me know, and I'd be happy to sell it from tonight's live stream. I'll sell it in the future, but it would be for a lot more. And 
And let's see here. Uh, oh, so so Dwayne says, isn't it also known as Cardinal Purple? That is interesting. That is interesting. It may very well be, but I love that idea of the Cardinal Purple. Now, are they talking Cardinal as uh, like the religious order? Like the like a cardinal bishop, like that kind of thing, or the actual color of a cardinal. Oh, great! So uh, I'm gonna get a link from uh, Bob. That's wonderful. Interesting. Very fascinating. So I've been a away from color a little bit. And now I'm kind of coming back into color with a vengeance. And uh, it's very exciting. Because anyone who knows me, I don't do anything halfway, you know? So when I come into color, uh, it's, it's really going to be coming from, you know, a very studied approach that I will share with everybody, anything that I find out. And I'm going to go with a darker tone soon, but I want to get these lighter tones first. Then on this side, we have some nice hairs that we should work on. Right over here, we have some darker, darker hairs. Oh, so there's a hard time uh, getting that link over across. Uh, I think you guys have a hard time sending links uh, with this. But Bob, if you email it to me, I'll definitely uh, pass that on to you guys. Oh, cool. So that is cool. And do you make your own uh, watercolors with that, Bob? Like, do you use gum Arabic? That's very interesting. You know, I've never been hired by an art store, although I applied many, many times since I was young, and they never hired me. Michael's doesn't count. Michael's is not an art store, and I only lasted five days. Michael's is definitely not an art store. Uh, but Blick, <coughs> Pearl Paint, Utrecht, those particular ones so not overly violet okay I'm looking forward to that and I'm gonna see if uh, the same thing what goes on with the sennelier so they're saying tomorrow it's gonna arrive but I know better I'm thinking Friday maybe Blick is the worst for shipping things they should say you know at, you know time of delivery heck if I know that's what it should say expect a delivery date sometime in the future that's about as far as they really should be saying thank you so much for that Bob that's gonna be amazing so I'm looking forward to that So see how I press down and then just kind of lift up? So I press down and then lift up. And that's how I kind of get the variation and then just lift up. She has a lot of hairs going in different directions and we want to definitely get that. A lot of little frizzies here. If she's watching this, she's going to be mad at me, but... So 
press down and I get a thicker line and then just lift up and get a nice thinner line. At this stage, you might see some angles that are off. At this stage, you have to live with it and you just make a mental note to do better next time. You know, that, you know, you don't want to make, you know, huge reconstructive changes at this point in the game. So this painting is, is getting close to being finished. How sad. Oh, so, so Bob makes watercolors made with pigment, distilled water, gum arabic, ox gall, as well as wetting agent. Interesting about ox gall, is it still made from the bile of the gallbladder of an ox? Because I know it used to be that, or is it more synthetic now? Because when I heard about ox gall, I was like, holy cow. And if it is, it's probably expensive in comparison to gum arabic. Now, do you find it, you know, that really helps you to get the colors that you really want by using the gum arabic and, you know, mixing your own? I mean, creating your own paint? Oh, Dwayne says that uh, the, uh, the cardinal purple uh, rang a bell when we talked about Caput Mortem. And to my knowledge, I see Caput Mortem as a semi-opaque, meaning that you can get it transparent, but it's mainly uh, an opaque color. Wow, distilled water, gum arabic, ox gall, that's amazing. And Bob, how do you like spraying watercolor through the airbrush? Uh, is that something that you recommend? Or is it something that you don't recommend because it's, you know, really difficult? gonna calm down some of some of these hairs here just calm this down make sure you get rid of I don't like the crossing here so I'm going to get rid of see how this cross kind of made that figure eight that's distracting even though I see it in the painting doesn't mean that we have to put it in there Notice as I get rid of that figure eight, it looks much better because people will believe a, po a photograph, but they won't believe a painting. Even though her hair made a perfect figure eight, they're going to be like, nope, there's something wrong. He didn't see the reference as it was. So sometimes you have to change it. And so that is cool stuff, definitely. And Bob says, yes, real ox bile. Oh, my God. And synthetic also works. You see, you know, they're going the way of synthesizing everything, you know, getting the, you know, made out of uh, chemistry, a lot of chemistry involved. And it's a good thing because it makes the paints less expensive, but it's a bad thing because... We're not using the same paints that Rembrandt used or Vermeer used. And sometimes we like wonder, why are we not getting those results? Well, they use something totally different, right? And, oh, right. So you can make your own pastels with pigment, champagne chalk, distilled water, and gum tragacanth. Tra wow, that's really wild. That's how Diane Townsend started making her own and have you done that, uh, Bob? And when you do, do you like your, when you mix your own, are you more like uh, the soft pastel kind of feel or do you like the hard pastels, like more art spectrum, um, that sort of brand, Rembrandt, new pastels. Uh, I don't like soft pastels, you know? I just don't like working with Senelier. I 
use them basically for the for the dark accents and that's it you know uh, so Bob says he likes spray and watercolors but inks are finer and more reliable interesting so that is fascinating so more reliable as far as you know tinting strength that kind of thing Very cool stuff. So as you can see, see how I I got rid of that figure eight? Because it just didn't work. Even though that was in the reference, I had to get rid of it because it just was not, it was not uh, being, it just did not look realistic. It looked out of whack. And now you can see it's less distracting and also this long hair here. I could definitely do without this. So I'll just kind of get rid of that. And now it's, it's less distracting and it flows a bit more and I kind of like it better. And same thing right here. Oops. Hey, Mr. Patrick, how are you, my friend? Great to see you. So glad you're here all the way from Massachusetts. And Dwayne says he sprayed watercolors and on and off for a bit a few years ago. Never could get the effect I was looking for. Do you find that um, that spraying watercolor, since it's uh, it reactivates, it's not waterproof? Is that something that kind of uh, was kind of like something that uh, you didn't like about it? Okay, so now I'm going to get some of my media mixture and we're going to get some real dark accents on that hair before we're in the final two minutes wow final two minutes of this painting really love doing this painting and once again just uh letting you guys know that i am selling this painting for 125 if anyone's interested no pressure whatsoever And a lot of times I like holding on to a painting for a long time anyway, you know. Uh, Bob, uh, uh, Mr. Willie purchased uh, the uh, Jody Comer. That was one of my favorites. I'm so glad that's in your collection, uh, Mr. Mr. Willie. I mean, that was really uh, a lot of fun to paint and she had a great expression on her face I love expression especially when I paint women I love I love over-the-top expression you know uh, it's just something that really gets to me Ah, thank you. I appreciate that. And it's an honor to have it in your collection, Willie. Yeah, remember with the glove? The glove was really hard. She had these, like, amazing leather gloves. And she was holding a, a murder weapon, you know? And just to have that kind of contrast of a beautiful, refined woman holding a murder weapon, which is like an envelope holder, an envelope opener, so that's the kind of stuff that really kind of, uh, I want over the type expression. There's enough stoic photos out there of people just, you know, holding it together and everything like that. But I want pure emotion because that's human. That's what we, we want, you know, we want to see pure emotion. Their humanity makes us more human. And that's why you know, you'll see that I concentrate on that. And when I do get to pose from the model, right, which I hope so soon uh, that I can get a model, and um, I, want, I have some great ideas. I mean, some really very original ideas that I want to do. So uh, hopefully 2023 will unlock some of those opportunities because I did learn how to photograph in the studio using 
using flashes and stuff like that. So uh, as you can see, just coming in darker, so you have that contrast of light hairs and dark hairs, which really makes a difference. And just kind of bring this down. Just like so. And of course, this painting is entitled, uh, titled uh, Whatever, because that's what she's kind of having an attitude, like whatever, you know, that's pretty cool. Okay, so we have a couple of dark hairs coming down here. So I'll just kind of drag that like that. Couple right over here. There we go. Ooh, do we have an opportunity to perhaps hit on her eyebrow eyelashes over here? I think we do. Yes, with this brush, you can definitely just kind of flick it and get these beautiful, very gentle eyelashes. I wouldn't do this except at the very end, something like this. A little bit of a dark, dark border on the outside of her iris. Dark accent there. down and let's see and oh Bob says yes he makes medium to hard pastels great mix as above he lets the mixture stand overnight thickens to a gel then extrude with a three or five millimeter syringe with a needle end sawed off let dry for a few days you know that's what uh, Edgar Degas did right he made his own pastels and uh, just amazing, right? Uh, also, I'm sure you know this, uh, Bob, because Bob knows a lot about art history and everything, uh, that he would liquefy his uh, pastels and then paint with that uh, liquefied pastel, which is interesting. I love pastels because it's the, it's the marriage between drawing and painting, very literally. You're right in the middle, which is great. Okay, there's a couple of hairs down here. We're just gonna put some of these in here. Just come over here like so. Whoops. Now I was thinking of darkening the uh, Celtic knots in the background, but I kind of like having it kind of loose. This way it stays in the background and it's something that the eye can really enjoy when they come up close. And Willie says, well, good night everyone. Tim, she looks beautiful and I hope to be back next week. Always a pleasure, my friend. Look forward to hanging out and Bob, I, I mean, uh, Mr. Willie, I hope you have a great weekend coming up. Always a pleasure. You are amazing, sir. Uh, Bob has, uh, I mean, uh, Willie has been at my live streams since like 2017, late 2016. I mean, long time. So thank you, Bob. Uh, I, I'll keep calling you, Bob. Thanks, Willie, for all your support and friendship over the years. I don't take it lightly. Uh, you are you are an amazing person. So I value you, sir. 
So look at us. We're at 1128. So that means we only have two minutes. Unbelievable. Thank you, everybody, for making this live stream so much fun. And it went by so quick. I mean, really went by fast. Um, just really enjoy, enjoy our conversations and uh, spending time with you. And uh, Wednesdays are just so great. And I really hope they continue for a long, long time and get to know you all better. Uh, that's what that's, I think, is the best part of the live streams, is just getting to know you and learning from you. So much great information that you share with me. And so I enjoy that a lot. And that's it. It looks like uh, she is very close to being done. Uh, complete, I say. Done. Complete sounds better than done. And... really enjoyed painting her I mean it's people might say Tim it took you seven live streams to do this I don't care because it's uh, it's the end result that counts and and to, to get this painting that looks like it was done in one breath you know what I mean you don't want a you know a bunch of features but you want something that looks like she was painted in one sitting uh, just natural and and cohesive and one human structure and uh, uh, thanks Willie and Bob says if you get into paint and pastel making Sinopia and Kramer sell great product great pigments Wow that's great information that may happen in the future uh, definitely getting inspired by listening to to you Bob you know that's for sure and it's 1130 so that means uh, our time this week is, is over, but thank you so much for hanging out. Thank you so much for the super chats, Jewel and Ori, and thank you, uh, Mr. Dwayne and Bob, you know, for the super chats. I really appreciate it. Pam and everybody, Mike and, uh, Colette and, you know, Steve and everyone hanging out, Roy and Todd and, you know, the list goes on and on. John Diekman, uh, you guys are all fantastic. Thank you so much for your time and for making my Wednesday memorable and making my week more palatable. I look forward to friendly people, uh, like-minded, and just uh, having fun with everybody. Uh, you guys are real friends, and I hope to talk to you soon. Bye, guys.